Occupational English test. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Nice to see you again, Tom. How are you today? I'm okay. So I understand that um, since I was seeing you um, that while ago, uh, that you ha you're in hospital again. Yeah. So can you tell me a bit more about what happened before that? Um, well, it was a few months ago now. Um, yeah, I'd done quite well for a number of years. Sort of kept it um, under control, really, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I've not, I've not seen you since your gap year, wasn't it? Yeah, so that was four years ago. Um, so, yeah, it was quite disappointing to, to go through it all again. Uh, but it sort of started um, at the, uh, towards the end of university. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing law. And uh, well, I was on course um, for a first, and I was just coming up to my... Uh, my final exams, mm -hmm. and I had a few essays and a few exams, and uh, so I just I started working really hard. I felt like right now was the real time to um, put the effort in and to to put the work in. So mm -hmm. I started to step a bit later, um, take on a bit more work. Um, so my stress levels sort of start to increase um, over a while. I uh, I was drinking a lot more coffee, took a few uh, caffeine tablets, um, and energy drinks, a few people, well, because sort of the environment at the time was a lot of people were pushing themselves that they wouldn't normally uh, mm -hmm. do, and some people were taking Ritalin. Um, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, which... Um, Did you take any Ritalin? Yeah, um, because it was just like, it was, it, that was necessary at the time, and... Uh, how did that affect you? Well, I it sort of increased my confidence at the time. All, all the, everything that was going on, I was becoming a lot more productive. Um, yeah, a lot more confident. A lot. Mm -hmm. um, I was working harder. My brain was working faster. And so I, yeah, my, my momentum was building up and up um, throughout the period. Um, yeah, and so I was, I was relishing it, and I was, um, yeah, doing a lot of work. And uh, so, what did that mean to you then to be at that time? Because it sounds like you put quite a lot of pressure on yourself. You've been doing really well at uni, and, and you know this was it. This was the time. What did it mean to you to be feeling like that kind of more awake and um, more energized, maybe? Yeah, well, for me, it was 
it was my sort of time. So I'd spent, I'd spent three years, I'd, I was in control, I was doing well. I didn't, I, it wasn't really part of my life at, at the time. I didn't really talk to any of my friends about it. Um, but then I, yeah, I started to just sort of grow into it. Um, and I took the opportunity to, yeah, enjoy this time. Um, and it, it didn't really reach its peak until after my exams. I was still, um, I was still functioning um, throughout my exams. Um, I, I have since found out that um, I didn't get the results I, that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you think that was? Um, well, I, I thought that I was working harder than ever, but uh, I, it was misjudged, I think. And so I, uh, yeah, I didn't perform to the best of my ability um, in like, when it came to the, to the exams, and so I, I didn't achieve. I didn't achieve a first eye, and I only got two on. Um, what else was happening for you around that time? I mean, you talked about the pressure of your exams and staying up for them. Was anything else going on for you um, around the same time? Well, so it was the end of the end of university, and that was the time where, well, as soon as that period stopped of work, then I was sort of let off the leash mm -hmm. um, a bit. And yeah, I just thought to, to grow uh, even further. Um, so I, I, I mentioned I was um, I was taking uh, Ritalin, drink a lot of coffee, and as as soon as that exams had stopped, I just substance abuse sort of took a bit um, okay. more of a hold. Um, and yeah, I just sort of grew into this person who I thought was him was um, the guy that everyone wanted to, to be around and to see. And so I made sure that I was just everywhere that could be seen. I was, you know, um, So this is like the, the gap after you finish the exams but before the results are out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, kind of few yeah. weeks. Um, so we were just going out a lot, but if not every night. Um, you said that you were taking Ritalin and drinking a lot of coffee. Yeah. Um, and um, using other drugs as well. Yeah, it sort of developed into um, cocaine, a lot of cocaine, um, MDMA, um, mm -hmm. MCAT. Uh, and how did they affect you? I honestly was on cloud nine at the time. Um, yeah, I... Uh, um, and so in this sort of role as the man, as the man about town, I was spent a lot on, yeah, alcohol, drugs, clothes, um, I invested in this technology. Um, well, having not had to deal with, um, my illness throughout university and for it not being a part of that world, I, I didn't confront those symptoms in a, in a way that's going to have long-term sort of stability. Um, as far, well, it began with doing the work that I needed to do. That's just, that's just what I needed to do in order to achieve my goals and to achieve what I want to. And then it just, I just let it take hold. And I... Extract two, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
So tell me when this started. Started on Tuesday morning around 9 a.m. He started to get a few red patches right across his belly and a few sporadic on his legs. Okay. And um, has he been sick prior to that? He had it just a runny nose. Okay. Uh, we went camping. So about Sunday morning, he had a fever and he started his runny nose. Okay, so started with fever and runny nose yep. and then this rash appeared. Yep. On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yep. And I know you were here in the office a couple days ago. Yep. And uh, they did some blood work and at that yep. point they were pretty sure this was a viral illness. Yep. Uh, and I remember talking to you on the phone that it was getting purplish. Right, right. And, um, and that was concerning because we know that it can right, be bad. Right, bad exactly. So you had a fussy baby. Fussy and baby. Uh, this little fellow is only seven months old, yep. fussy with fever and then a purplish rash, yep. and you were absolutely right to call okay. because sometimes that can be meningococcus, and meningococcus is a bacterial infection that can kill you like in 24 hours, yeah, not good. and so I'm absolutely yeah. happy you called. Awesome. And so as we look at these purplish lesions, when I rub really hard with my finger, you can see they turn white turn normal skin color. The purple goes away momentarily and then it returns. Any rash that you can make blanch, so you can make it go away, that's okay. Especially, we'll take a look at this little guy's face here. Um, he's still, I mean, he's not super happy, but he's still pretty alert. And that's always a good sign. When you have that bad rash that doesn't blanch and a kid who's just, uh, this particular re reaction, because we were, we've evaluated this young fellow twice in two days, this has been progressive, and what's happening here is we've got bright red, pink, new rash that's actually warm to touch, if you look at this rash, and as that rash disappears, it leaves a bluish, <laughs> sort of almost a bruised looking purple rash, which you can see areas that are sort of purple. Oh, this, basically, this is hives. This is an allergic reaction to the virus. So what we have here is a viral infection and his body is mounting an immune response as well as an allergic response. And, and hives come and go. A classic hive lesion, you can see one on this shoulder where there's got a little central clearing. It's kind of a little more whitish in the middle and red around it. That's sort of a, an example of a target lesion that you see with hives. The key with hives is in general your child is not that ill. Now, he happens to be somewhat ill because of his viral illness and fever, so that's what makes this particular situation both confusing and very important to have it evaluated by somebody that can really make sure that you're, you're not missing that petechiae and purpura, the non-blanching rash that can be associated with meningococcus. What we're going to do for this, since we know it's hives, if you're at home and you have a hives-like reaction, maybe a mild one, you're going to use something like Claritin or Benadryl, mm -hmm. just those basic anti-hive, anti-allergy type medicines, and sometimes that's enough. In a more severe case like this, we're using prednisone. It's a stronger anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. but you definitely would not want to be getting your hands on prednisone without having a doctor evaluate first because prednisone can cause problems if you're giving it to a child who has a bad infection. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, that's why I wanted you to come absolutely. in. And thank you for doing that, yes, coming in. Absolutely. And uh, he's a trooper. Now, of course, you should know that prednisone can make you really grumpy. So if you get like beyond grumpy, <laughs> so some kids who are so irritable on prednisone that they want to be picked up. And as soon as you pick them up, they want to be put down. As soon as you put them down, they want to be picked up. If that scenario happens to where he's just more miserable than he was before, okay. then just stop it. Okay. And this is going to run its course. Because it's related to the viral illness, viral illnesses often run for seven to ten days. Okay. Unfortunately, it's possible his hives could last for seven to ten days. Or since we're on our fourth day yeah. or something like that. You know, the other main causes of allergic reactions, we think of medications. Right. Uh, and then we think of certain foods like yeah. peanuts and eggs mm -hmm. and strawberries. Yeah. But usually the peanuts is the top of the list or, or shellfish. Okay. If you have an allergic reaction to a food, you stop that food, right. within two, three days, it's gone. Interesting. So okay. even though he, I think he had strawberries a while ago. On Sunday, yeah. You know, today is Thursday. It would have gone away if it was just from that strawberry okay. that he had four days ago. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is hives related to his viral illness. So it would look just like this with a food allergy, possibly, but it would dissipate 
Possibly. I, I haven't seen too many food allergies quite this severe. Okay. Uh, but but that's the general idea. These red lesions with yep. the with the little uh, slightly raised hives are also irregular margins. They kind kind of come and go. That's that's the the real hallmark of hives. Also, is that coming and going. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Now, I just have to go through some possible side effects of the gastroscopy, if that's okay with you? Yes, fine. Uh, first of all, I can assure you that in most cases the procedure is problem-free, but I have to point out to you some side effects so that you are aware of them before you sign the consent form. Is that okay? Yes, fine. Right. Uh, well, some people can have a mild sore throat for a day or two after the procedure, and if you have been given something to make you drowsy, you may feel a bit tired afterwards as well. And some people can get a chest infection or pneumonia. But remember, this does not mean that you will necessarily get these as well. Okay, I hope not. <laughs> and uh, on the odd occasion, the endoscope can cause some bleeding or infection in the gut and can also puncture the gullet or stomach, but this happens very rarely. I see. Uh, is there anything that you would like to ask me, or go over again, or are you okay with all this? Question 26. Now read the question. Let's see now. Mrs. T. Hawthorne, uh, date of birth 4th February 1963, hospital number 1834572Z. Uh, she was prescribed Tremadol today, 15th October 2009, given intramuscularly 50 milligrams started on 13th October at 11.30. All okay. Mm, maximum frequency every four hours. Maximum dose 600 milligrams. Okay. To be administered as required intramuscularly and given by senior nurse bond. Question 27. Now read the question. So, that's all done. Was there anything you wanted to ask me? Yeah, I've still got this big gap on the other side. I remember you said we might do an implant there, too, but that it'd mean a slightly different procedure. If I remember correctly, you said that you couldn't put one there because of the bone, mm -hmm. but that you could connect it to the tooth next door. Is that right? Well, partly. What we discussed was what we'd do if you lost the next tooth along. So we'd have to extract that one. Right. Then you'd probably need a bone graft there so that we could attach two teeth to a new implant. 
The gap you're talking about is where you've lost a big molar. Right. We couldn't fill that gap completely using this technique because that'd put too much pressure on the implant. I see. Well, you said the price would be much higher than the one I've just had done. I guess that's why. Uh huh. Question twenty-eight. Now read the question. Challenges.、Um, I suppose there's positive, and you know we have to look for the positives of that.、Um, for me, a big challenge really in terms of nutrition is that everybody eats and drinks, so everybody has an opinion on what they are eating and drinking. And athletes are no different than the general population.、Um, you know, you can hear messages or、um, stories or、uh, information coming across, and sometimes that information. Might be suitable for Joe Public on the streets, but in terms of an athlete that's training twice or three times a day, that can often be a difficulty. And you know, factor in a couple of、um, other things like you know changes in body composition, trying to gain weight or trying to lose weight. Athletes sometimes struggle with those particular、um, aspects of things, and, and quite often sometimes want to go for the the quick fix, and sometimes. My messages are, are quite often the longer fix type messages, and that can be a challenge. So, I suppose for me as a practitioner, the challenge for me every day is to make that message、um, real. It's to make it suitable to the person that I have in front of me, but also it has to be relevant in terms of the science behind it. So sometimes the science. Doesn't really change, so I have to change the message or the way I adapt the message for the individual. Question twenty nine. Now read the question. Okay, we need to do our debriefing. Any comments about the case, Jackie? Well, we were late getting started due to a delay in getting the surgical consent to come in. But I've talked to the junior resident, and I think we just had a few crossed wires there, so it's sorted. Yeah, we were busy in clinic this morning, but we were also delayed getting into this room because the case before us went over their time, which pushed us back. That's becoming a regular occurrence with that particular team. I'm going to ask our nurse manager to adjust their time slots based on the recent history of their cases. We were also slow to get the portable films from radiology. There were several rooms requesting films, and radiology seemed short-staffed. That's unusual for them, but let's keep an eye on that, and if it happens again, raise it as a concern. Question thirty. Now read the question. In bed twelve, we have Liam Ogilvy.、Mm -hmm. Liam's a forty-five-year-old male who was involved in a motorbike accident and was admitted with a frontal lobe contusion. He's broken his right arm and hand and has had surgery, including metal plates inserted into his arm.、Right. He's also got deep grazes on his left knee and ankle and stitches on his right leg and shoulder. All dressings have been changed this morning at nine, and he's on self-administered morphine drip as well as an antibiotic drip.、Mm -hmm. He's had injections to prevent blood clotting, and his pain's quite manageable with the medication he's on. The doctors requested some observation and testing regarding memory loss, so that's priority this morning.、Mm -hmm. His right arm's in a cast, and he'll need regular monitoring and a physiotherapy sessions booked later in the afternoon. Somebody's coming to collect him at four. I've just checked his vital signs and he's stable with blood pressure at one three five over ninety five. It's a bit up, so you'll need to watch that.、Uh -huh.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. One of the lead researchers, Dr. Larry Apple, who specializes in testing diets. Previously, we had done three major feeding studies. By feeding studies, I mean studies in which we provide everything that a person eats and drinks for a fairly long period of time. Some of our studies have been, lasted up to a half a year. So our first study was DASH, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, that identified an overall dietary pattern that was helpful in terms of lowering blood pressure and cardiovascular risk. Then we did a, a study. Which was a diet low in salt and high in fruit and vegetables. Actually, it tested attributes of diet other than salt. So salt was held constant, but the, in the diet that was most effective was a diet that was rich in fruits and vegetables, low-fat dairy products, and reduced reduced in saturated fat. Then we did a second study that addressed the issue you brought up, Norman, which was the uh, effects of salt on blood pressure. In, in that, we did a dose-response study, and the lower the sodium intake, the lower the blood pressure. Then we did a third study where we said, okay, well, those diets, the DASH diet is relatively in high in carbohydrate. What if we reduced some of the carbohydrate and replaced it with protein or unsaturated fat, mostly monounsaturated fat that you would get from like olive oil, for example, looking for the optimal diet to lower blood pressure because because blood pressure is such a powerful risk factor for heart disease and stroke. The diets that were higher in protein and higher in monounsaturated fat had a slightly better reduction than the original DASH diet, but not so much that you would say we should change our guidelines. It basically said, you know, if people reduce their saturated fat, they can replace it with carbohydrate, unsaturated fat, or protein, which is a good message, you know, that gives, gives people flexibility. Then our fourth study is the Omnicarb study. That was a study to look at the effects of glycemic index on cardiovascular risk factors. And so the idea was to say, okay, people have been espousing a low glycemic index diet is helpful. Typically, in terms of heart disease, what you see are signals related to LDL cholesterol, blood pressure. And to our surprise, 
there really were no major effects of the low glycemic index diets on risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So if you were a participant in our study, you would have been randomized to a sequence of four different diets. So one, and you were your own control because you went through all four diets right, yourself. Right, so you could compare your effects on one diet to your effects on the other diet. So here are the four diets. One is high carbohydrate, high glycemic index. That's what we said was our sort of control diet. Then high carbohydrate, low glycemic index. Those are carbohydrates that take a bit more time to get into the bloodstream and, and you avoid large fluctuations. Then the third diet was low carbohydrate, high glycemic index. And the fourth, and the one that we thought would be the, the best, would be low carbohydrate, low glycemic index, okay? So we are really interested in the control versus that one. Now, each of those diets, by the way, were fed for five weeks. People consumed all five weeks of the diet, and then we measured very rigorously, you know, the risk factors, um, lipids, blood pressure. We measured insulin resistance as well, and uh, we really did not see any benefit from the diet that was low in glycemic index. And wasn't there a bit of harm from one of the diets? I was agnostic on this one. I wasn't quite sure what the direction of the results would go, but I thought that if anything, there would be a, a signal of benefit. And actually, there was a bit of a signal of harm. It was one of the diets that had the low glycemic index. LDL cholesterol seemed to go up, which is the form of cholesterol that is considered bad. Um, I think Frank Sachs argues that the, the, the categories of food around low glycemic index, it may well be the fiber in them that's the issue, not the... Yeah. See, this is a common issue with studies of diet or food or nutrients, is that nutrients don't cover in isolation. They're what they call confounding. Nutrients travel together. So typically, most foods that are high in glycemic index are low in, in fiber. And foods that are low in glycemic tend to be higher in fiber, sort of like the, the white rice versus brown rice or whole grain. So that's where we sort of think this is going, is that you can get the benefits that we attributed to low glycemic by focusing more on other aspects of diet. Moving now to obesity, which you've done a lot of research into, you've tried behavioral change, you've tried feeding diets and so on. How would you sum up the state of the art from your research in terms of what you've found? Doing feeding studies, it's one of my favorite forms of research because you, you get clean answers. Our participants... It's not the real world. It's not the real world, but it tells you what would happen if you consume this diet. What you get with behavioral intervention studies is, well, can you in the real world follow a diet? And so individuals have to deal with all of the things that you and I deal with. So have you found in your research behavioral interventions which look promising? I have done a fair amount of work on helping people who are overweight or obese try to control their weight and you do get some benefit from various behavioral interventions. Such as? What we typically try to get individuals to do is to, first of all, know where their calories come from, so they actually do what they call food records. So some individuals, it might be sugar-sweetened beverages, other people it might be large portion sizes, other people might be frequent eating across the day. And then what you do is, working with a counselor, you identify types of foods, episodes of calorie consumption where you can pull back and where you can make substitutes and do things that are feasible. The challenge is that in order to lose weight, you have to have pretty big calorie deficits. So people typically say in order to lose a, about a pound every other week, you need to reduce your calorie intake by 500 calories per day. To do that, you really need to track your weight, track your calories. And so we actually embed in most of our interventions now tools to help people self-monitor. The other thing that we do is we try to have some type of continued intervention because weight loss interventions are not just something that just sort of you give it and it's over. It really requires some efficient way to sort of continue it with fairly frequent contact but doing it efficiently. So instead of having a person either meet you or call you, you have some sort of inexpensive approach to sort of keep you engaged over time, which we think is really important. And very quickly, a huge problem in Australia, which is damage to your kidneys, which sure. can affect your health profoundly. Yeah, that's a, another area of, of my interest. So I try to look for interventions that are modifiable. And so I've been interested in diet, physical activity. With kidney disease, it's probably a mixture of modifiable as well as genetic. You accumulate this, it's aging, it's heart, it's arterial disease, it's drugs, it's all sorts of things that accumulate kidney damage as you get older and increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes. 
Aging is, represents the cumulative burden of exposures or bad things that have happened to us over time. So if we're consuming foods that damage you know, our arteries, our kidneys over time, that'll progress. Now, now I don't want to dismiss the effects of diet. There have been other investigators who have focused on diets rich in fruits and vegetables and there might be a benefit in terms of what we call acid-base balance, where we're providing some what we call bicarbonate, which is a base, that actually helps to preserve kidney function. It's early evidence. I think there's a good signal there. But there's, there's something going on. I can tell you that just in this community around Hopkins, very high prevalence of chronic kidney disease, proteinuria, which is a manifestation of kidney disease. And um, many of us think that it's something about the environment. And I personally think it's uh, an adverse diet that is actually contributing to it. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Dr. Catherine Frenette. Some of the numbers we're reading are really kind of shocking. I was reading that the number of uh, unresectable liver cancers has actually grown by 115% in the past decade. Why, why are we seeing some of these numbers rise when it comes to liver cancer? So liver cancer um, or cancer that starts in the liver is really caused, most patients who have liver cancer have underlying liver disease or cirrhosis of the liver, scar tissue in the liver. And we're seeing more patients patients with fatty liver causing cirrhosis and an increase in liver cancer because of that. And then also still seeing a lot of patients with hepatitis C developing liver cancer, even though we've got great treatments for that virus as well. So a lot of times people connect liver disease with people who drink mm -hmm. excessive amounts of alcohol. But uh, as you're saying, hepatitis is a factor here and we're, we're seeing it in more people that maybe aren't be abusive of alcohol. Absolutely. Alcohol isn't even the most common cause for cirrhosis. The most common reasons really is fatty liver, which is associated with diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, and, and the metabolic problems that we're seeing on the rise as well. And then viral hepatitis is the second most common. Wow. So when we're talking about treatments of, of liver disease, liver cancer, there's really not too many options out there. What are, what are we looking at as far as, as new treatments and treatments that have been shown to be somewhat successful. Yeah, so when, when we're thinking about liver cancer, as I said, most of most people have underlying liver disease. So liver cancer is a little different than other cancers because we have to think about the underlying liver problems in addition to thinking
cancer itself, which is why a lot of liver cancers are treated by liver doctors and not necessarily cancer doctors. So most of the time, the best treatments are surgical, either cutting it out or doing a liver transplant. But unfortunately, most patients, about 80% of patients, aren't diagnosed in time to get that surgical treatment. And that's when we really are talking about the unresectable or inoperable liver cancers, um, where we're now thinking about the new treatments that we have available. And I would imagine as we see with other cancers, the reason it's being diagnosed so late is because the symptoms are kind of all over the place. So let's talk about the symptoms and what those typically are for both liver disease and liver cancer. Yeah, so liver disease um, really doesn't cause a lot of symptoms until it's advanced. And this is part of the problem with diagnosing liver disease and diagnosing liver cancer. As I say to my patients, the liver is a very forgiving organ. So it has to go through a lot of damage before it actually causes symptoms. And that might be things like tiredness, itching, yellow eyes, swelling in the legs, swelling or water buildup in the abdomen, um, and confusion and not thinking clearly. Those are some of the advanced symptoms that we see. But when it's early liver disease, we really don't see a lot of symptoms at all. Liver cancer is the same way. So if you think about the liver, it's about the size of a football. We want to find a cancer when it's the size of a golf ball. And you can hide a lot of golf balls inside of a football without having any symptoms at all. So when somebody has liver disease, it's important that we actually do screening for liver cancer. And we check them every six months with lab tests and imaging tests, an ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI, so that we can find these cancers when they're early. How, who is a good candidate for doing screening before there are any symptoms? Maybe you have a history of it in your family. Maybe you uh, know that you haven't been exactly great about your alcohol use or smoking, other risk factors. Mm -hmm. Can you walk into your doctor and say, hey, for, for my liver function? Absolutely. So liver function screening is really just a lab test. If there's an easy lab panel that we can get, and primary care doctors often do it, but not always, as part of the yearly physical. But if you have risk factors for liver disease, it is important to know what your liver panel looks like and know whether you have liver problems or not. Okay. And are there different way, ways to diagnose uh, what, the, what the problem might be if the liver function test is Yeah. Off? So if somebody has elevated liver function test, tests, then the next step is we do a whole panel of labs to try to diagnose why they have those liver, pan liver function problems, because there's a lot of things that can affect the liver. Um, we also see sometimes where people can just have one-time elevations of liver tests, and, and it goes back to normal, and that doesn't mean anything as long as if it's just one-time elevated, unless you also have risk factors. Yeah, so again, that forgiving organ. Yes. And really, liver cancer, even though we've seen these numbers kind of skyrocket, it doesn't seem to get the attention that some of the other cancers do. Why do you think that is? So I think that, so liver cancer right now is actually the fifth most common cause of cancer-related deaths. And it's actually the only, one of the few cancer deaths that's actually increasing in incidence and frequency as compared to decreasing. Most cancer deaths are actually going down. Liver problems, as you said, oftentimes are associated with alcohol or drug use or things like that. So there's a lot of social stigma that happens when people who have liver disease and I think that's part of it um, where we're not really seeing that information come through because there is that stigma. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
is the end of the listening test. Please stop writing and wait for your question booklet to be collected.